I am with uh, the uh, Rural Measures Project, which is a project at the University of Nebraska Kearney. Um, as we are, we're trying to uh, trying to get better granularity with internet broadband data and speed. And uh, so we're doing, uh, we're actually measuring individual throughputs, which is, no one else has done so far. So broadband disparities, first of all, just sort of establish that, in fact, they exist. Um, so there's significant differences in, in broadband access in rural and uh, between rural and uh, urban areas. Um, the gap actually appears to be going larger from what data we have, which is fairly limited. Um, but um, COVID-19 has sort of highlighted a lot of these disparities and pushed through a lot of money in Congress to actually rectify some of them. So we see disparities in school and access to, say, watching, going to school online or healthcare or through government services. There are rural subsidies, and there have been since even before 96, but especially 96. But um, as we'll see, there are problems with the way that they're located. Um, the FCC data is uh, is bad right now. It's really bad. And it's intentionally bad in some ways because of the industry, but I'm going to that. Um, so we need more granular data to actually determine where actual where our needs are. So here's just a brief timeline of uh, broadband. So in the U.S., um, Telecommunications Act of 1996 established the principle that there should be sort of broad level of quality between rural and uh, urban areas. Um, in 1999, the first definition, FCC definition, was established. Um, 200 kilobits symmetrical, which is not very broadbandish right now, but it was actually a decent speed back then. Um, then in 2009, uh, Congress allocated $350 million um, independent of the FCC to map um, to map broadband. This money um, was allocated on a state level for state level mapping and restricted to only nonprofits. This was probably done to let the industry control it. I mean, almost certainly there were industry control groups who were nonprofits and none of these maps are currently used. None of them are any good. Um, essentially, uh, I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Um, the uh, industry won't allow price data to come out on a lot of other things. So some, some cooperated and some didn't, but they, did, they only gave the information they wanted. So then anyway, we went up to a four, Four megabits by one megabit, and then uh, 2015, we're at 25.3. Um, it's passed already, but it won't be implemented until probably next year, maybe 2023. We'll have a 125 standard. The original standard was going to be 100, 100, but a lot of the larger ISPs are really, really opposed to increasing the upload speed. So we got 125. So mapping broadband. Um, so there's been, as I said, there's been a lot of attempts to do it. Um, so the difficulties have been the industry claims that the price data is proprietary, which this is one of the reasons, honestly, I haven't seen the data that I'm using in a long time, but we can see in my data or the data that we have is why they, why they see this. Um, many refuse, just refuse to participate. Nonprofits tend to be very, very um, friendly with the industry. They tend to be funded by the industry and their boards tend to be dominated by members of the industry. Um, so the FCC in 2009, actually the same year that Congress tried to map out, they began to require what's called Form 477, which requires reporting speed data to the FCC. But um, as we'll see, it's kind of flawed. Um, and then 2020, which is the new act, they're supposed to increase, uh, they're supposed to fix some of the problems without, with the data in the next few years as far as Form 477 goes, but we'll see if that actually happens. So Form 477, um, so there's a lot of problems. One of them is the census block. An ISP can claim that they serve the census block, which in rural areas, census blocks can be quite large. <laughs> if they can provide service in 10 days to one house within the census block. <laughs> so as you can see, that's not a particularly good standard as far as where actual access exists. Um, all the ISP throughput is self-reported. There is a, there is an aspect that, that is reported. that's actually recorded, but the, uh, the ISPs are told beforehand where this is going to be. So of course they make sure that the, the throughput is good. And uh, as I said, there, there's a huge overestimation of coverage. And the uh, in the corner we have here, this is um, this is a very good paper that was uh, major at all out of 2020. They uh, queried the larger ISPs databases, so where can I get service from their actual consumer ends, and then they uh, versus what they claim on the FCC map. And you can see that the greens are rural areas. The uh, it's a, a several day. I think they did oh, what is it nine states. The uh, red, or excuse me, the uh, the, yeah, the reds are urban. As you can see, there's a huge difference, sometimes 40% from what they, uh, 40% uh, less than what they actually claim they serve in rural areas. And it's not really a, much of a problem in urban areas. They generally serve most of it. So more so than a lot of other policy issues, maybe any other policy issue, broadband access is a cartographic issue. And it's been, it's been framed that way and used this way for since it's began. So, um, well, yeah, but, well, first of all, there's the comparisons made to rural electrification and those sorts of things. And um, it's actually considerably more comp complicated than that because access, of course, is not binary. 
Um, you have degrees of service versus degrees of electrification, which are not the same. Uh, you also have moving targets and the ideas of what is adequate service. Um, and it's not easy to visualize as I ran into. I joined this project in July and, uh, maybe they came up with a lot of issues. How do you visualize this? What is in the, a the average expectation of service? And I'm actually, we're working on some papers that are, are explore that with satisfaction, which no one's really done before. But, uh, is it the average? Is it the fastest? Is it median? And, or is it even, is it median or mean? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways you could think about it. Or uh, advertise speed or throughput. It's, we'll see there's a, quite a bit of difference between those two. Sorry, I'm, I'm still getting pop-ups over here. There. So this is just Nebraska. This is from the Forum 477 data, just for the state of Nebraska, which is where our project is. And um, so this is the advertised speeds. Of course, everyone here, all this area, except the white, which is virtually uninhabited, says that they meet the uh, the, the uh the definition of broadband, they always do. They always claim they do because they can get subsidized if they do. Um, but uh, so this is what the FCC claims. This is the FCC map. And this is what the ISPs claim. It's going to come. You'll notice there's sort of a in South Central Nebraska. There's a large blob of of pink. This is going to come into play in the two the two different areas that we have. That's sort of that's actually a rural area, and there's a local fiber company that uh, that came about about seven eight years ago. So Microsoft in um, October of 2020 released actual data. So they released data of how many people that use their services are at broadband speeds on in the county level and zip code level. This is a map of the county level. So as you can see, these household percentages are quite a bit lower than, so they're actually, they're two different things. One is showing the supposed throughput and one is where the supposed advertised broadband, not the throughput. This one's saying what percentage of households are actually using broadband speed which is uh, defined as 25 megs and 10 up. As you can see though, that um, there's quite a bit of households that have very, very low broadband penetration in the West. This is the difference between the, uh, the percentage difference between the FCC and the, uh, the Microsoft estimates. And it's huge. Some places it's up to 95%. Um, there isn't a really an underlying pattern here though, as far as I can see, generally um, places that have pretty good internet have a uh, have lower percentage they have a uh, less drop off but uh there's not a whole lot of correlations i've ran a lot of correlational analysis and things and there's not a huge difference there's not a lot of patterns to see but here is um just some basic correlations between some of the data as you can see there's a 0.44 correlation between the fcc and the microsoft data and uh, with density a lot of these things are just expected you have a but um, there is an underservice even here of, uh, of rural data, but it's not extremely pronounced between the two. It's just the FCC data is bad overall. So the, so the project I'm with is rural measures, and this is some of the data I've worked with. So we're, we're trying to independently report and visualize the rural-urban divide. Right now, as I said, we don't have independent data. Um, so we're collecting the data out of a modified Raspberry Pi. As you can see, Tim has in his hand one of them. Um, we send these out through the, ele the public electric company, ask people if they like to participate. If they will, they send them out to, they send them out and they hook them up to their internet connection. And, uh, it will stay on for one week, pre usually, sometimes it might sound too long, but, uh, and it will take, um, it take a reading every five minutes for one week. So that's a lot of data. It's a lot of data with grand, a lot, very, very grand. Nobody has any data that's anywhere near this granular. Um, so we do convenient sampling because we have to. We've dubbed it the uh, quantitative throughput. So the, it clicks in two parts. It clicks download, upload, ping, and IP address every five minutes. It also has a GPS unit on it, but we found that a lot of them, it wasn't particularly accurate. I use it to double check some things, but um, I, I use other ways to find the, uh, the actual location of these things. Um, and then they, it also prompts the participants to take a survey. So this is another unique aspect is that we're linking this data, this really, really granular data with, pers with actual demographic information. So we're asking them how much does it cost, but we're also asking how how, are, how much are you satisfied with this, and, all, and a lot of other questions, along with demographic information. So uh, yeah, and then there's the Likert. I haven't got to the Likert data yet, and uh, I'm kind of looking into. Not many people work with Likert geographically located Likert data, so I'm trying to figure out exactly sort of methodology here. But as I see, this is the old map, but these are the two study areas. And I did not intend this, but, but because of the way that the electric utility sent them out and wanted data, they actually created two pretty distinct study areas. So it actually worked out well, but it could be a natural experiment. So these are the two rough study areas. And I uh, see the one at the bottom has, uh, has the uh, fiber. 
And this is our current sample. I'm sorry, this is, uh, there's 200, or approximately 200, 250 of these. Some of them are, you just have to zoom in more to see them. There's two kind of outliers. I did not include those near Carney and this one. These are just participants that were from our school and I took them out because they didn't really fit. So here are the two study area demographics. They're very close, but the northern, just notice that the northern sample is wealthier. And, uh, which, um, so the northern sample is merely wealthier, but, uh, they're actually, I mean, as you would expect, it's Nebraska, it's pretty homogenous in a lot of ways. So, but there is certainly, there's a little wealthier, a little more educated in the northern sample. So, uh, here's just some spatial autocorrelation with the variables, just to figure out exactly how the variables operate and what, and what scale they operate on. So this is average download. Notice the, these are different. That's a nine and that's a four. So the average download operates around 25,000 meters is where there's the most spatial autocorrelation. The uh, upload, although, operates further out. So upload is most like when you zoom out, kind of zoom out of it. And uh, well, this is probably due to the fact that fiber. So you're getting 80-80, like the fiber plans give you 80-80, so you have equal, and then a lot of the commercial plans will maybe give you 25-3. So you're having to look at a larger area to find more correlation with those plans. But it's actually a very high. All of these are very much higher correlated than the, so they're giving you a 4 z-score versus a 9. So all of that upload is much, much more correlated than the download, which is less, which is less correlated. Also, here's the reported cost. So, uh, as you can see, costs are hyper local. This is the reason I think that the industry doesn't want to report this is because costs, cost is based on very, very local patterns and not in some sort of overall speed. It's based on what are the prices within 15 miles of where you live. And um, obviously it's kind of upsetting when people know that they're paying more or they're paying less, depending if they're living so close to some object, to some objective measure, which it's not objectively based at all. And then we have a, the plan stop download. This is reported top download. This actually, minus some of that spike, is actually quite close to the curve that you see on the download data, which actually validates what we're doing. So this is this is just some GWR to figure out, hey, I'm going to see cost, which is geographically weighted regression. I'm going to use cost as the independent variable and the average download, average upload, average paying performance. So this is local R squared and ignore it, it's low, it sucks. But um, the point of it is, is we can see where it's the lowest and where it's the best. So cost, so you see the areas with, with, uh, with fiber, the south have the least correlation between these performance metrics and the cost versus the areas up here, which are less served and all, all honestly served by larger ISPs are, so you can see a definite difference between the two service areas and it has to do with cheaper fiber. So the tentative conclusions are that prices are anchored to highest service level in the immediate area, say within uh, within 20 kilometers. They're not method, not by method of delivery or the measured throughput. And there's no correlation between price and speed, as you see, 0.044, there is none. And even weighting that geographically, it's, I think it's even lower. Um, so the areas in the, in the affordable group, the areas in the Southern group happen to have affordable fiber and the Northern group doesn't have more limited options, but they pay just as much or more. Um, so there's an elastic, a very elastic pricing model going on here. And so increasing speeds is not likely to increase consumer costs. So, I mean, obviously this has regulatory, this uh, has regulatory issues. So localized highly elastic pricing models should strongly incentivize faster, more permanent infrastructure and FCC increasing broadband standards, especially with which we're working obviously in a regulatory environment where there's already a, there's already lots and lots of subsidies. We should be directing these subsidies in this way because uh, the, it doesn't look like it really affects much. So and we should also avoid rural subsidies to going to subpar delivery that barely meets current FCC definitions. There's a whole cottage industry of these um, terrestrial wireless and satellite providers who barely, who that's their thing is they barely meet the rural, the aspect of rural broadband and they get subsidies for it. But those are not sort of permanent solutions. They're just ways to get federal subsidies. This model strongly suggests that we should uh, be looking for things like fiber and things that would be more long-term. Future work is, um, this data is awesome. I'm glad that I got it on this project. There's a lot you can do with it. I barely scratched the surface of it. I just started working. Um, but I want to examine the connection between throughput and education and health outcomes. Um, also, as I've sort of, sort of given some policy stuff here, but there's a lot more policy 
policy things that can be gleaned from this with a, as far as household throughput needs, which is another thing you can work, you can reverse engineer and get household throughput usage, which someone's done before. They've done surveys, but they haven't actually looked at objective numbers. And also create a series of metrics that we can look at broadband and throughput expansion. Where would be the most bang for our buck? Okay. Uh, that's all I have. So any questions? Uh, I have not, but that's been something that I, um, sorry, could you, could uh, it repeat the question so I can repeat it, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the question, so the question is about there's an option for rural, essentially rural broadband, the rights to build it in certain places. I have not specifically looked at the data yet, although I'm aware of the data source, and it's certainly something that I would like to bring in eventually. Um, right now, I'm on tentative data analysis. Um, policy implications will come after we get everything together. Right now, we only have those two areas. Eventually, we want to cover most of the state. But, so we're, we're just sort of, we're not holding pattern right now because we're just getting in more data. <laughs> It does. Um, uh, the northern area around Columbus is, uh, well, some of the, the actual, the western area, they're served by just, there's very little service, so they're served maybe terrestrial wireless. But Columbus itself has a lot of national players in it, which is sort of the city there. The southern area traditionally did not, but there was a, a local company started fiber there. Uh, I don't want to give names. I'm in Trump. I don't want to give any. Well, okay, this is Glenwood Fiber. So anyway, they started about seven or eight years ago there and started doing this. And uh, it seems to, uh, um, they're providing better, so honestly, they're providing better service for a better price. And then the competition has actually lowered the price on everything in that region, even though that region is richer or poorer than the other. Okay, that's, we have time. Thank you. Thank you so much.